Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to welcome you to the forum on Laudato Si, the papal encyclical on care for our common home. I'd like all of you to please rise for the Philippine National Anthem and then remain standing for the invocation to be led by Father Jose Mario C. Francisco of the Society of Jesus, professor of the Loyola School of Theology. We call upon you, God of life and love, to bless our gathering this morning. We thank you for molding us out of water and clay, baked in the sun, dried by the wind, infused with your breath. We thank you for planting us in a tiny corner of the great beyond, filled with fiery light and dark matter formed billions of years ago. We thank you for calling us your partners in sustaining your world with respect and developing its riches with intelligence and imagination to create the new earth and the new heaven you promised to all. We thank you for our beloved Pope Francis, who has challenged us to embrace our origin and our destiny, to heed our calling, and to confess our greed. We thank you for our beloved Pope Francis, who has joined voices with the earth and the teeming life within it, with our sisters and brothers, excluded from its riches and our wealth, with those ever seeking to understand its workings. Today, we ask that you send us your spirit of wisdom during our conversation on Laudato Si, so that we may never cease to love the work of your hands, may always sharpen our insight into its mysteries, so that we may act and live courageously with greater simplicity and generosity in accordance with your will and our calling. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, Word made flesh, Word made matter, forever and ever. Thank you very much, Father Mario. This year marks the 150 years of the Manila Observatory, the Jesuit scientific research institution which began with the Padre Federico Faura doing systematic observation of the Philippine weather. From being recognized as the official Philippine institution for weather forecasting 
in 1884. It continues research work in the fields of atmospheric and earth science in the Philippines and the Southeast Asian region. Although the Manila Observatory is not part of the Ateneo Manila University, it has remained a close partner as they share not only historical roots and Jesuit tradition, but also the goals of sustainable development and poverty reduction. May I now call on Ms. Maria Antonia Yulo Loisaga, Executive Director of the Manila Observatory and a member of the Board of Trustees of the Ateneo de Manila University to give the welcome remarks. They put a small podium here so I can actually be seen from, from the front. Yes, good morning and welcome to all of you uh, who have come to join us this morning. Uh, bottom line, up on top, we'd like to say thank you to the Cardinal and to all the panelists who have joined us this morning and, uh, and all the dignitaries, the sisters and, and, our, and our brothers and fathers who have come to join us to celebrate together with the Ateneo um, University. While the Ateneo and the Manila Observatory are no longer two, one institution, we are joined by a familiar concept called the Interlocking Directorates. Uh, Father Jet Villarin is president of the Ateneo. He is also chair of the Manila Observatory. Father Mario and others are also part of our board of trustees. While we cannot claim to be part of the Ateneo, the Manila Observatory will be deeply grateful always as it was born out of the curiosity of young scholastics and priests then serving at the Ateneo Municipal. 100 years later, the observatory sought to return the favor to the Ateneo de Manila University as it established the physics department at the Ateneo. The physics department is 50 years old this year. The Society of Jesus established the observatory in order to serve the Filipino people through scientific excellence. At the cusp of our 150th year, our mission has not changed. Scientific knowledge and research are essential building blocks of sustainable development. While there have been advances in technology far beyond what our founders could have imagined, the fundamental challenges of facing the Philippines and the rest of the world are the same. Where do we find energy, water, and food to support a humane existence for all? The Philippines is rapidly becoming an urban nation with most of its population living in flood plains and coasts. We are situated along the Ring of Fire and face both the Pacific Ocean and the West Philippine Sea. The heating up of these bodies of water generates tropical cyclones, extreme weather events such as monsoon rains. Unfortunately, poverty and inequality have not decreased significantly in the last few decades. And migration to the peri-urban areas and urban areas is often seen as a pathway to a better life. When combined with extreme weather, these increases in population density, the persistence of poverty and income inequality, which are really forms of chronic vulnerability. These constitute the essential ingredients of a disaster. Our world can sustain us only if we constantly strive to understand scientific relationships between space, our atmosphere, land, oceans, and people, and learn how through in seeing God in all things and in, in uh, adopting the right formula for investment and collaboration in scientific research, our hazard-prone country can become, through faith and science, a transformed country, truly developed and truly sustainable. Thank you very much for all of, the, for all of you, uh, your attendance here today, and thank you to the Ateneo de Manila, the Ateneo Institute of Sustainability, Atshut Kuyagkeng, and all the staff for supporting this event today. Maraming salamat. Thank you, Tony. Now we may call on uh, Father Jose Kilong Kilong of the Society of Jesus. He's the president of the Loyal School of Theology to introduce our keynote speaker.
Luis Antonio Gokim Tagle was born in Manila on June 21, 1957. Hulaan na lang kung kanyang edad ngayon. After completing elementary and high school at the CICM run St. Andrew School in Paranaque City, he studied philosophy at the Ateneo de Manila University as a seminarian of San Jose Major Seminary, graduating summa cum laude and as philosophy departmental awardee. He obtained his degree in theological studies from the Loyola School of Theology in 1982. Chito as he is fondly called, was ordained to the priesthood on February 27, 1982, and became associate pastor at St. Augustine Parish in Mendez, Cavite, until 1985. During this time, he also taught theology at San Carlos Seminary, Loyola School of Theology and Divine Word Seminary, and was spiritual director, then rector of the Diocesan Seminary of Imus, Tahana ng mabuting pastol in Tagaytay City. He was sent to further studies in sacred theology at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C., where he obtained a doctorate in sacred theology in 1991. In 1997, Pope John Paul II, now Saint John Paul II, appointed him member of the International Theological Commission of the Vatican. And in the following year, an expert at the Special Assembly of the Synod of Bishops for Asia that took place in Rome. The Pope then appointed him Bishop of Imus and was ordained to the Episcopacy by His Eminence, Jaime Cardinal Sin, on December 12, 2001. Pope Benedict XVI appointed him as the 32nd Archbishop of Manila on October 13, 2011 succeeding Gaudencio Cardinal Rosales. He then named Archbishop Chito to the College of Cardinals on October 24, 2012, the seventh Filipino admitted to the college. Pope Benedict XVI has appointed Cardinal Tagle to various positions, including membership in the Congregation for Catholic Education, the 13th Ordinary General Assembly of the Synod of Bishops on the New Evangelization, the Presidential Committee of the Pontifical Council for the Family and the Pontifical Council for the Pastoral Care of Migrants and Itinerant Peoples. Since 2014, Pope Francis has appointed Cardinal Tagle to the Pontifical Council for the Laity, the Sacred Congregation for the Institutes of Consecrated Life and Societies of Apostolic Life, the Sacred Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples, and the Pontifical Council Cor Unum for Human and Christian Development. Cardinal Chito was also appointed President Delegate of the Synod of Bishops on the Family, President of Caritas International, and most recently, President of the Catholic Biblical Federation. But perhaps what sets Cardinal Tagle apart is the way he communicates to his flock, open, joyful, compassionate, caring. As Emeritus Archbishop Cardinal Ricardo Vidal wrote, he is the bishop who can both laugh and weep with his people. Cardinal Tagli is a man truly in love with God and with his church. Talagang laudato si ang kanyang personality. Ladies and gentlemen, His Eminence Luis Antonio Cardinal Tagle. Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Maraming salamat, Father Joe, sa napakaganda mong sinabi. Dalangin ko lamang na sana totoo yun. 
Uh, I would like to thank Father Jet Villarin and uh, the Ateneo de Manila community and the Manila Observatory community for inviting me to give this keynote address as we celebrate the 150th anniversary of this wonderful institution at the service of science and faith and human development, the Manila Observatory. And we also celebrate this milestone of an encyclical from Pope Francis, a Jesuit Pope, Laudato Si Mi Signore. Praise be to you, my Lord. My task this morning is uh, to give you some sort of an introduction to the uh, encyclical. I could give that introduction in one minute summarizing everything by saying, please read the encyclical. <laughs> this talk cannot be a substitute to reading the encyclical itself. But I have to warn you, it is the longest encyclical so far written by a pope in the history of the church. Well, I think the topic calls for a comprehensive approach and uh, we thank the Pope and his collaborators for such a successful outcome in Laudato Si. So after giving you a background of the uh, encyclical, I will indicate from my point of view a few things that I think merit our continuing reflection and hopefully action. This title, no? comes from the invocation of St. Francis of Assisi, the Canticle of Creatures, when Pope Francis chose the name Francis in the conclave that elected him, I was there. <laughs> People started murmuring, Francis who? Savior? After all, he's a Jesuit, but he was quick to clarify, Francis the Poverello, Francis of Assisi. And true to form, this saint, who is called also the patron of ecology, becomes the inspiration of this encyclical. The Pope reminds us of our common home, our sister, our Mother Earth. Sister Earth who now cries out to all of us because of the harm inflicted on her due to our irresponsible use or abuse of the goods God has endowed her. And the response that Pope Francis proposes to all of us really comes from Pope John Paul II, a global ecological conversion. We are happy that conversion is now linked to ecology and global at that. So the key concept that the encyclical proposes to us is integral ecology. To articulate the fundamental relationship of the human person Personhood is relationship. We are related to God. We are related to ourselves. We are related with other human beings. We are created to the earth and to the whole of the environment. Let us keep in mind that this is the key concept, integral ecology. Now, the different chapters of the encyclical can be considered as steps that we can take in order to enter this world that is being opened to us, the world of integral ecology. So, the first chapter, what is happening to our common home? Now, we can consider this as the step of listening, viewing spiritually, and listening spiritually to scientific research, 
science and spirituality. Let us listen to the results of the best scientific research on environmental matters that are available to us. The Holy Father proposes this. Science, as at its best, can help us listen to the cry of the earth. What a beautiful way of putting the task of science. Science at its best can help us listen to the cry of the earth. Now the Holy Father did his own listening and his own seeing. He pointed to the following things, pollution, waste, premature deaths, deaths of children, the earth looks like a pile of filth. <clears throat> and he says, at the root of it is the throwaway culture. We throw away anything that we don't find useful, even human beings. Elections are coming. You see a lot of throwaway culture being manifested. The climate, the changes affect entire populations. And in fact, it is not just war, ethnic battles that cause migration. We have a lot of people who migrate because of ecological or climate changes. Water, contaminated water, and the poor deprived of access to water. That's why there is a move to declare access to water as a basic universal human right. The loss of biodiversity, the extinction of plants and animal species, an extinction that changes the whole ecosystem. And the Pope reminds us that species are not just exploitable resources. As we tap into them, we should be sensitive to the effects you know, on the whole ecosystem and life. The decline in the quality of human life and the breakdown of society. The Pope questions the growth model that uh, prevails. It does not always lead to integral development. I'm very happy to note that here in the Philippines the past two years, there have been a lot of fora dedicated to inclusive growth. People are now asking, how could growth really embrace everyone? For a while there is growth being registered, it seems that it excludes many people. How do we achieve growth that includes everyone, especially the poor? Cities are becoming unlivable. But they say 70% of the world's population now lives in cities. And cities are expanding. And in the cities, there's very little contact with nature. In fact, in one meeting on evangelizing big metropolitan centers, I raise that question. The parables of Jesus Christ are agriculture rural based. The fishes of the sea, the mustard seed. I mean, when people live in the city, mustard, that's uh, for the hot dog. <laughs> mustard seed that grows into a big shrub. I mean, what does that mean to them? You talk about the sun, the stars. Do they see the stars? They see illuminated lead advertisements. We need to search for new parables and new mediations of God's presence. That's not in the encyclical. <laughs> Global inequality. The Pope says the poorest, the poorest people are the most vulnerable you know, when climatic changes happen. So the true ecological approach is also social. In the line that was made famous by Pope Francis, he says, the cry of the earth 
and the cry of the poor, they come together. These are some points which the Holy Father uh, raises in the first chapter. So maybe we can do our own listening. We can do our own looking at our own contexts and add to the list that the Holy Father has just given to us. The segue to the second chapter is quite uh, typical of Pope Francis's style. He just avoids, you know, all of this uh, convoluted diplomatic language. He says he's not happy with leadership in the world right now, especially with political leadership. There is no willingness, there is no determination to implement change. And with that, he leads us to the second chapter, which is the gospel of creation. He picks up from the wealth of the Judeo-Christian tradition, particularly the biblical texts and theological reflections on those texts, he relies heavily also on not only his predecessors and their encyclicals, homilies, and teachings. He uses a lot of the pastoral statements issued by Episcopal conferences all over the world. So aside from talking about integral ecology, the methodology that he employs in this encyclical is also that of collegiality. He brings into the papal magisterium different teachings from the national and regional Episcopal conferences. The bishops of the Philippines issued a statement in the 1980s. The Pope quotes that. The Asian bishops' conferences also had a study on ecology. The Pope quotes from that document. Now, the gospel of creation. He directs the Christians to the wealth of our tradition. He says, while it is true that the ecological concerns require interdisciplinary approaches and interdisciplinary dialogue, we cannot exclude religion, faith, spirituality. Faith traditions have a lot to share to the whole world about caring for our common home. Our biblical accounts, we have a God. The God who liberates is the same God who creates. In fact, historically, Israel got to know God first as the God who saves, the God who liberates. The God who uses the forces of nature in order to liberate God's people. From liberation to creation, those two should not be separated. Creation, liberation into full human dignity. That is what our God is all about. And human life is grounded in relationships with God, with neighbors, and with the earth. According to our Judeo-Christian tradition, the earth is a gift. It is not a possession. God possesses it. We are not the owners. We are stewards. That's why in the tradition of the church, Ab uh, private property is never absolute. When the common good requires it, then you must be able to give up, let go of private property. For us, the theological underpinning is that we are not owners. So 
you know, save yourself the, the trauma and the trouble. When somebody borrows money from you, do not think of it as your money. So that when it is not returned, you don't get angry. <laughs> it's not mine. <laughs> That's how I face it. <laughs> Kasi pag inisip mong akin yan, inutang sa akin, lalo kang galit. No? Pag inisip mo, di man akin yan eh. Pinadaan lang sa kamay ko. Nasa kanyang kamay na. Pag dumaan ulit sa akin, salamat. Kung hindi, walang nawala sa akin. Kasi hindi naman akin yun eh. Try it. Try it now. Mangutang kayo sa katabi nyo. Tignan natin kung laudato si. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's not in the encyclical. <laughs> now, each creature has a purpose. Very Franciscan. Very Franciscan. Even in the weeds, St. Francis would see beauty and purpose. Very Christ-like. And there is interconnection, interrelatedness between creatures. The earth is a shared inheritance. That's why the goods of the earth are destined for all and not just for a few. Jesus, the Word of God, through whom everything was created in the fullness of time, became a creature, became matter, became flesh. And the incarnation of the Son of God blessed creation all the more. He lived this earth. He lived on this earth just like one of us. He died here and was buried on the earth, but brought the earth to the resurrection, into the fullness of life in God. a rich tradition. That leads us to the third chapter, or the third step. After seeing both the situation and the richness of the Judeo-Christian tradition, now the analysis. The human roots of the ecological crisis. The human roots. And the Holy Father is not content with symptoms. He wants to go to the roots. He identifies some, and he invites us to converse with him, to dialogue with him in his analysis, and again, for us to add our own inputs. First, he says, a misuse of technology. While technology is very good, and we can uh, all attest to the benefits that we are enjoying thanks to technology, there is a way of uh, using technology that becomes pride, dominance, economic, political dominance. He says technology needs sound ethics. A, uh, a, a culture that will allow limits and self-restraint. He says, part of the problem is that technology opens to us so many possibilities, and one, <laughs> one uh, direction of pride is, if we can do it, we should do it. He says, that's pride. Is there no limit anymore? Is there no more self-restraint? Another root cause for him is this uh, misguided anthropocentrism. The view of the person as possessing full dominion over nature. So he says we need to recover the sense of responsible stewardship. We should protect life. And here, he says, part of pride is the manipulation of human life, especially in abortion. That's pride for him. 
Another cause, practical relativism. Since I am the owner, since I am the boss, I disregard laws. I disregard principles. I disregard truth. They are not upheld. Laws are avoided rather than implemented for the common good. And he says that's rooted in this practical relativism. Everything is relative to me. I'm the only absolute. I am the owner. Then he says another root, the loss of the value of labor. We need to protect employment. We need to protect the laborer. And work is not just for income. Work is for human development. With work, I grow as a human being. People ask me, why do you continue teaching? You're already laden with work. Listening to Father Joe Kilong Kilong enumerate my tasks, I felt tired. I said, wow, is that you, Cheeto? Is that the story of your life? You know, but when people ask me, why do you continue teaching? You're already a bishop, you're a cardinal. I said, that's the type of work where I've experienced human development. I don't find it tiring. Even if you don't pay me, I will teach. That's true. But you have to take care of the laborer. <laughs> But how many people work because they find joy, development in their place of work? How many? I don't know. But the Holy Father is alerting us to that. New biological technologies, genetically modified organisms. He admits that there have been some gains, but some problems remain and they need to be addressed. So, he is inviting all of us to a broad, responsible, scientific, and social discussion, even debate, on these causes, these roots of the ecological crisis. The fourth chapter contains his proposal, Integral Ecology. Centered on the human person, let us find our unique place and we already mentioned the human person is relational. Find your place in the world by rediscovering your relationships with God, with yourself, with other people, and with the environment. This integral ecology will provide a new paradigm of justice for how how do we conceive of justice when we are always connected? What type of justice will it be? What concept or notions of justice will arise if they are rooted in connectedness, human connectedness with everyone? So environmental, social, human issues are always related. Here are some elements of the integral ecology that he proposes. First, as I had already said, economic, social, human, and environmental concerns are interrelated. Yung ating singer, si Joey Ayala, di ba? Meron siyang kanta, Ang lahat ng bagay ay magkaugnay. Yan. Yan yun. Everything is connected. All creatures form a network that will remain a mystery that we will never fully understand. We will continue uh, exploring that, especially through scientific research. But knowledge needs to be integrated into a broader vision that relates the ecosystem to social integration, to institutional decisions for the common good, and quality of life. The second, he says, 
integral ecology includes cultural ecology. Remember the Pope's speech to the families when he was here in the Mall of Asia. He alerted us to what he called ideological imperialism or colonialization. Now, it appears again here. Cultural ecology. Part of our ecology is the culture. So he says, what he is proposing now in taking care of the environment is take care also of your cultural environment, your cultural treasures, the treasures of humanity. And here, he issues a special appeal for the protection of the rights and the cultures of the indigenous peoples whose cultures are neglected and destroyed in the name of so-called development. The third, the ecology of daily life. He says, look at the urban uh, environment, those in charge of uh, urban planning. Is there public space? Is there sufficient space for housing? How is transportation? The relationship between human life and the moral law. We don't have absolute power over our properties, our bodies, etc. And he proposes again what is contained in the Catholic social teachings, the common good. He calls on everyone to make choices in solidarity based on option for the poorest and the most vulnerable. Bring the excluded into the center of our planning and our choices. And finally, integral ecology includes justice between generations. We should not look only at our generation and what we need. We should look to the future generations, what type of world will we pass on to them? The poor of today and the generations of the future should be very much present in our planning, in our decisions, in our choice of lifestyle. Are you still with Pope Francis, mm -hmm. <laughs> the fifth chapter, we're coming to a close here, the fifth chapter now leads to action, lines of approach and action for the renewal of international, national, and local policies. He invites the business sector, government sector, to review their decision-making processes. So here in this chapter, he really invites the working together of those in politics, those in business, those in the sciences and technology, and those in religion. He says, think of our world with, with a common perspective or a common plan. Let us not let the destiny of the world be determined by a few countries and a few influential people. Politics and business should abandon short-sighted efficiency or profit orientation or short-term electoral success. Ang dami-daming pinapangako no, para lang may makuha ang boto and then hindi naman ma-sustain. No. Alam na natin lahat yun. <laughs> the Pope also calls for honest, honest and transparent decision-making so as not to harm the most disadvantaged. Avoid corruption which conceal which conceal real intentions and deals. Tapos later on, dun mo makikita. 
pinag-usapan naman pala. Tinago lang. Politics and business for human development. He says the market forces cannot be allowed by themselves to dictate on us. For market forces cannot safeguard envi the environment and human development. Maybe we should slow down production, sabi niya, so that people will develop. <laughs> Bahala na yung mga, ano, no? Uh, and let us review notions of progress and development. 